children and grandparents. Parents! That's right. Did you get that one? Yeah. That last clue, uh, uh, Sam is fond of saying. And uh, so we, that's what we're going to talk about today. If you would open your Bibles, Proverbs chapter 24 is where we're at. Who are parents? <clears throat> um, you, you may know, you may remember, you may not. Um, but I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that today is, uh, um, well, actually this month is Pastor Appreciation Month. And um, I really always want to take a, a, a moment and just acknowledge that, not so much for my sake, but because um, for several churches now, I've served on a staff with other pastors, and I appreciate them. I appreciate so much our senior pastor who, uh, who just whispered in my ear and said, I've got to go, and that had a rough night last night. She's having a hard time. I need to go be with her. Amen. Amen. Um, and Teresa and I know what stage they're in. It's, are we very sensitive to that because we know about what stage they're in right now and, and what she's dealing with. And, and so you lift her up. It's been a, it's just a hard time right now. Pain's still there and still wondering if it's going to quit or ever end. And, and we know that's a hard time, don't we, honey? So I appreciate him in that. I appreciate that he is sensitive to people and, and, and Pastor Sam is, is sensitive to what's going on in our world, Right? And, and so in the, in the room there, he said, you know, we're preaching through the book of Proverbs. He, says, he said, uh, Derek, with your permission, uh, next week, I'd like to move the series on down and let you preach the next Proverbs because I want to talk about Israel. Handing me his notes. That's great respect. He didn't have to do that. He can do whatever he wants <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But that's what I love about him. He's sensitive to that. And at the same time, Pastor Sam wants to just regularly teach through Scripture um, and not watch the news every week to figure out what to say. And it just, but once in a while, you got to stop and uh, address something. And he's sensitive to that. I, I'm, I so appreciate him in that. I appreciate uh, Coach. Everywhere I've ever served, um, in, including my very first church, I've always either had on staff or in leadership um, in, as a volunteer a pastor who's older than I am, usually much older than I am. I'm not saying Coach is much, much older than I am. <laughs> Um, but I've always been blessed by that, and, and so blessed by that here, of course, obviously with Sam, but even with Coach, there are so many times that Coach speaks into my life, and I appreciate that, brother. Um, in, in Here at, at Twin Lakes, as in those other circumstances I mentioned, I may have senior authority uh, over Coach or those other guys I mentioned, but those guys, like Coach, speak into my life, and, um, and I need to listen. And I appreciate that you do that, brother. I really do. Appreciate our pastors. Um, we, we have a basket on the uh, Welcome Center out there. Uh, if you'd like to just appreciate um, our guys in some way, and you can do that. And we'll leave it at that, all right? <clears throat> we're going to look at what are parents. Speaking of the news, so a few years ago, there were sentences handed down, you may remember, for those who were convicted in college admission scandals involving athletic uh, coaches, test-taking experts, and dozens of parents. Do you remember that? It's been just a few years ago. They were charged with bribery, with fraud, racketeering, and money laundering. There were 33 parents who were charged and accused of funding bribes to perpetuate the fraud. Some paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you remember, to get their kids past the SAT scores to get into certain colleges such as Yale, Georgetown, USC. Um, Hollywood actresses Felicity Huffman and Lori Laughlin were among those parents indicted. Huffman paid $16,000 for a false SAT score to get her dollar, daughter into college. And then uh, Huffman, <clears throat> or excuse me, Laughlin and her husband were accused of spending a half a million dollars to get their two kids into USC. U.S. Assistant Attorney Eric Ro uh, <clears throat> Rosen said, 
The message is simple, but it does need to be said. If you pay, receive bribes. If you lie and cheat, and if you engage in a scheme that ultimately results in the theft of a college admission spot from someone who deserves it, then you will be criminally prosecuted, and you will be sent to prison. Laughlin, as you know, know, may remember that uh, she was a star on the family show, Full House, back in the 90s. And I... You know, I don't want to pick on one person or even a couple of people with respect to this illustration, but it always amazes me. It really does. It always amazes me how much attention Hollywood actors or actresses get when they speak to social issues. I mean, it's amazing to me because Hollywood is absolutely, completely socially, morally, ethically, and relationally bankrupt. What in the world are we doing paying attention to their advice for? But the sad truth is that these particular events are characteristic of the dysfunctional parenting that has saturated our culture today. Family after family is filled with many things, materially and with activities. And yet, those same families who are so full of things, of activities to do and material things, walk around on eggshells because they're really not enjoying life. And so, the wife constantly nags, husband's rarely home, the parents fight each other, and and sometimes it's the reverse in what I just said. And the kids really don't know where they stand because often the parents blow up at them out of nowhere, and so they often just play one parrot against the other. And that's where our culture is so much of the time. Now, the culture has a solution and, they, and, 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 and to all of this, <clears throat> and that is basically this. Parents, here's the culture solution. Parents should basically pursue whatever they want and let the kids raise themselves. I mean, isn't that what we see? Isn't that what we hear? <clears throat> you have to do is ask my son who's a teacher to understand that reality or any of our teachers. But that's what our culture does. So what you do is you just be your child's buddy and... You let them decide whatever they want and dismiss the rules, dismiss the punishments, and let the, then let the schools raise them. And what do we have as a result? Violence, depression, suicides off the rails among young people. So <clears throat> Hollywood and the media and some politicians offer some solutions, but most of those solutions are all addressing the symptoms, not the cause. Folks, the cause, the cause is the landslide of selfish pursuits in our culture. So what is the, what is the answer to a happy home? Where, where, do, we, where do we find it? Where is, where is the solution? Folks, it's where it's always been. It's found in God's Word. The wisdom of God is the key to a happy home. Look, you can write these down if you want, but <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1 Chapter 17, verse 21, chapter 23, verses 15 and 16, as well as verse 24 of chapter 23, chapter 28, verse 7, and chapter 29, verse 3, all say this. They all say that God blesses wise families with happiness, but curses foolish families with sorrow by allowing them to have what they want. Proverbs is a family book. It's a book about the family. In fact, specifically, remember the, the background. We have a father teaching his son about how to live wisely with respect to life's choices, life's decisions, lessons for life. It's full of lessons for life that a father's teaching his son. And there's all kinds of topics, all kinds of issues, and we're studying this one now that he's been teaching his son. It's all about relationships. It's all about family and friends. And then in particular, today, we're looking at parenting. We looked at dad. We looked at mom. We looked at the family as a whole. Now we focus in on this one about who is a parent. Now, I, I want to pause and, and, and remind you of a couple of things about this, how you view this. Remember how you view Proverbs? You don't view Proverbs as a list of do's and don'ts to try to achieve in order for God to love you, accept you, forgive you, and welcome you. He, he loves and welcomes you anyway, right? It's, it's called grace, It's not how you view Proverbs. How you view Proverbs is what we can grow in, what we can work toward, because we love Jesus, because we are accepted. We want to follow Him. Sometimes we stumble. Sometimes we we do well. But we keep trying and we keep working 
to be better. What did Paul say at the end of his life? He said, I haven't achieved it yet, but I'm still working on it. I've not fully matured, but I continue to strive. Now, that's how you view Proverbs. God accepts you. He loves you. He forgives you, but you keep striving to grow. You with me? I'm so thankful that, and Pastor Sam laid that out for us last week. Remember we talked about, when he talked about moms? We're accepted. We're loved. We just want to keep growing. The other thing you want to remember is, as we go into this, is don't look at your past mistakes. Because you'd be tempted to go, I wish I'd have done that. I feel horrible that I didn't do that. I'm so glad God forgives us. Aren't you? Sometimes you need to learn to forgive yourself. So that's not what this is about. It's just a beat-me-up list. <clears throat> not at all. In fact, here's the reality. You can still grow in this no matter who you are. For many of you, it's with your grandkids. Some specific things we look at today apply to parents alone. Some apply to grandparents. and Some grandparents are raising their kids, right? Some apply to single moms, single dads. And really, if you're a believer, you have spiritual kids and grandkids all over the place. I know lots of aunts and uncles even who function as, spirit, as parents in some form, even if the kids don't live with them. So <clears throat> there's lots and lots of applications here. So what we're going to look at is these areas through which we can grow in. Are you with me? Here's two basic things that this, this we're going to look at, and we're in chapter 24, verse 3 and 4. It says, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A parent puts children above things. We're going to watch a, a little spoof about what things parents never say. Things never say. And uh, Robert, watch the volume on this. Sometimes it gets kind of low. Okay, you ready for that? Let's just, let's just have some fun and watch this. You said that I can wear the sweatshirt. Actually, no. Yeah. Hey, kids, no, keep no, arguing. Don't, don't worry. Know. You'll stop eventually. You said that I can wear... You're taking a shower again? Didn't you take one last week? Why are you reading that book? You know they made that into a movie, right? So the dentist told you to brush and floss. <laughs> what a waste of time! Are you doing homework? <laughs> Lame! You didn't finish all your veggies? Da, neither did I. Okay, I know it's a school night, but why are you going to sleep so early? Mm. You're leaving crumbs all over the table. Just blow on it, and it'll go away. Take your time putting your shoes on. I got all day. Whoa, take your jacket off. I know it's cold out, but it's good for you. Okay. Oh, you need help with your math homework. Oh wow, this is exactly how I learned it when I was a kid. Why are you looking out the window? And why aren't you looking at your phone? Are your hands dirty? Don't worry, just wipe them on this wall. Oh, Deadpool. That sounds like a good family-friendly movie to watch. Good night. Oh, and don't forget to wake me up in the middle of the night for a glass of water, okay? Hey guys, I made pizza for breakfast. You need $10? Sure. Take a hundred and spend the rest on candy. Oh, are you going out? Okay, make sure you stay out as late as possible. Don't even bother calling us. Whose fingerprints are these? And how come you didn't cover the whole mirror? Check out this TikTok I just made. Thanks. Too funny. You know, what's, you know what's really sad is this is things parents never say that, right, in today's culture, many of them just say. <laughs> Isn't that something? I know it's for fun, but, but let's look at it in truth, folks. When it comes to priorities, Dallas Theological Seminary professor Stan 
Tosin taught 47 years in seminary, taught scripture, loves the family, loves the Bible. He says, priorities are indeed peculiar, but they are essential. And they go a long way toward producing a strong, biblical, and happy home. You know, all of Proverbs is really teaching us about priorities and the consequences of those choices. And when you first read the text we just did back in verse 3 and 4, when you, when you look at that, it can be a little confusing because you, you, you may immediately get the impression that material wealth is gained by wisdom and that's what makes a happy home. But why do we immediately want to run to that in our mind that that's what that text means? You know why? Because of the flesh. And all of us still wrestle with that. The flesh in us immediately wants to, to go there in our mind. Uh, listen, our riches, what the Lord, material riches, our material riches, what the Lord says truly makes us happy. Is that what Jesus said? Well, no, not at all. We may, so we, we may want to think that's what the passage says, but, that, but that's not the case. If that's true, then why was Jesus born in a cattle trough and remained poor the rest of his life? <laughs> there is a balance in Proverbs when it comes to money, positive and negative. All right? On the positive side, here's what Scripture teaches when it comes to material things. It teaches us that, that if, you, if, if you gain material things through wisdom, that's good. So it teaches us to be generous, to provide for our family, to leave an inheritance. That's, that's on the good side. But there's also the negative side that Proverbs teaches us, and that is that material things can also become an idol if we're not careful. So we have to keep it in proper balance. And what Proverbs teaches us, that if there is a choice between being a wealthy family, if, if I have to choose, and only get, this is the way it's going to go, either I'm a wealthy family or a happy family, which one's the choice? Happy family every single time. That doesn't mean one can't be wealthy and happy. Don't misunderstand the text. But the book of Proverbs, it says, when it becomes to the choice, if that's what I have to choose, then I'm going to choose the happy family over the wealthy family. Proverbs 15, verse 16 and 17 says, Better is a little with fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner with herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Proverbs 17, 1, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. What are all those verses teaching us? They're, they're instructing us and teaching us that it is better to have crumbs to eat under the table, if you will, where, where if there is love, than to have a fancy house and tableware with tension. In reality, friends, children that God gives us are meant to be the true treasure we acquire. The children are the treasure, not the material stuff. It's the kids that become the treasure. Psalm 127, 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. So, <clears throat> here's what Proverbs teaches. Spend more energy spending time with your kids than making money for them. Everybody listening? Spend more time with them than making money for them. Because there's so many parents who've orphaned their children even though the kids are still in the home. You know what I mean? They've orphaned the kids. The kids live as the kids live with them, but they don't know them. One of the most, one of the saddest secular songs that I've heard in my life came out years ago. Reba McIntyre sang it. You know where the line in the song is: "The greatest man I never knew lived just down the hall." And if you understand the song, that's what it's about. The kids lived in the home, but he never knew them. He was always too busy doing stuff and making money to ever know his kids. Now, here's the reality. As a pastor, I bet, Coach, this is true for you, I have never had an adult come to me and say, you know what, I had, I had such a terrible childhood because my parents were always there for me and spent so much time with me. I've never been told that in my life, have you? But I've been told the opposite of that sentence. Play a game with them. <clears throat> Read the Bible. Pray with them. Go to their school events. And let me stop here for a minute and just remind you of something. When it comes to, to academics and to sports, listen carefully. Focus on the kid, not the academics or the sports. If, if, it's all, if it becomes all about the achievement, if it becomes all about the GPA, or if it becomes all about the trophy for the parent, then here's what's really happening. 
The parent is selfishly living vicariously through their child. It's the parent who wants the trophy. It's the parent who wants the GPA. And they're trying to get it through their kids. Folks, love the kid. The other things are just stuff. They're just stuff. Parents put kids above stuff. Secondly, parents put the Lord above all. Now look at our key verses again. Now now remember where we're at in Proverbs now is that it's, it's... Every other verse or so, he's changing subjects on purpose because that's how you teach life. <clears throat> Every day, you teach this, and you teach that, and you teach this, and you teach that. So we're just, for the sake of sermons and study, putting them all together in each message scattered from throughout the text. So if you look at our main, where we started today, it says, By wisdom a house is built, and understanding is established. If you want a house filled with what God defines as riches, which is happiness and goodness and harmony and kindness and love, then you have to build it on wisdom. Now, we've already studied where that comes from. Wisdom comes from God. Proverbs 1.7, the thesis for the book of Proverbs, says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so God creates everything in His wisdom. And in His wisdom in creation, He creates everything to work a certain way. And when it works according to God's design, it works well and there is blessing. But what so often happens is humanity pursues things selfishly, and when they do, they break all that. Proverbs 8 teaches us that the Lord is wisdom. He Himself is wisdom. So, because the Lord is wisdom, He reconciles what we break. In other words, if I pursue first and foremost my relationship with the Lord, then He reconciles or fixes or brings peace with what I've broken. In other words, when I put Him first, He brings peace in my heart, listen, and He brings peace relationally. If the Lord was first in every relationship, the relationship would be at peace. So we're to pursue Him first. Which means if there isn't harmony in the home, if there isn't harmony in the home, then there's a Jesus problem in the home. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, what are we doing? Spinning our wheels. We're laboring in vain. So here's a couple more principles. Here's Here's some things we can continue to work on. Parents need to train their children by being an example of wisdom. How do I train my kids? I show them. And we'll get to telling them in a minute. But I can tell them all I want if I don't show them by my own life, and they're not learning anything. In fact, they're learning how to be hypocrites. <laughs> we need to show them what it means to live in an authentic relationship with the Lord. Look at these verses in Proverbs. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children have a refuge. Do you see how when a parent or a grandparent or a spiritual parent, when we pursue a walk with God, it affects our kids? <laughs> Proverbs 27 says, The righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. It's a direct connection. Warren Wearsby said, When parents walk with God, they give their children a heritage that will enrich them throughout their lives. Godliness puts beauty within the home and protection around the home. The world wants to perpetuate that fortress and kidnap our children and our grandchildren. But godly parents keep the wall strong and the spiritual weapons ready. Not in every case, but often children turn out like their parents. So, what then should we do? If children often turn out like their parents, because they've watched their lives. In other words, their li- the lives of the parents affect the lives of the children. Then folks, listen to me. Then what they need to see is they need, or what our kids need to see, what our grandkids need to see is they need to see us pray. They don't need to just be told to pray. They need to see us pray. Y'all with me? (laughs) They need to see us worship and sing the hymns of the faith with enthusiasm. Don't they, Gary? They need to sing us. They see us sing with enthusiasm. They need to see us worship. They need to see us minister. They need to see us fulfill missions. They need to see us sharing what it means to, 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 to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord of our life. They need to see us do all those things. In other words, they need to see us live at home what we're teaching at church. Because here's the reality. Regardless of what we say we believe, it's how we live that really matters. 
did you say that right, Pastor? Yeah, well, here's what I mean. You're going to live what you believe, no matter what you say. And your kids will know it. They will know what you believe by how you live. Now they'll see you. Listen, will they, you, you mean so they're going to see me sin? Yeah, they'll see you sin. But folks, it's not the absence of sin which defines us. It's how we deal with it. You're not going to stop sinning until you go home to heaven. It's how you deal with sin that defines you. What do I do with it? They need, listen, you know what our kids need to see? Parents, grandparents, they need to see us repent when we sin. <clears throat> how to be right with God. How to get right with God. They need to see all of those things. Parents need to instruct them. So they need to see us be an example, but they also need the, they do need the instruction in lessons for life. They need to know. They need to hear. We need to teach them how to manage money, how to do their chores, how to live with integrity, how to tie a shoe, how to hold a job, <clears throat> all of those things. They need to be told that God doesn't separate the sacred from the secular. You know what they need to be taught? They need to be taught how to choose a mate. How to choose a spouse for life. In our staff meeting this week, Gary, I love what you said. I'm going to quote you. I don't remember you were quoting somebody else, your aunt. Here's what he said. When it comes to making a decision about who you're going to spend the rest of your life and build a family with, here's the question you need to ask. Do I trust the salvation of my children to that person? That has eternal consequences. That's powerful, brother. Gary shared that within our sta- in our staff meeting, that that was what his aunt often said. Do I trust the salvation of my future children, or my children, if I'm in a, in a, with, with a single parent with children considering marrying someone else, do I trust that person with the salvation of my children and their spiritual growth, I might add? Parents, grandparents, we need to teach our kids about that. How to make those decisions, how to make those choices. The God doesn't say, okay, here's this part of your life that has to do with me, and here's the other stuff you just kind of figure out. Do what you want. No, all of it. He is Lord of all of it. Every bit of our life, every part of life, Proverbs is reminding us, is to be walked and led under His Lordship. In all your ways acknowledge Him. He directs your path. When they need to be taught, how do I talk to people? How do I respect authority? How do I choose friends? How do I, how do, I do all of that? And you know what else they need to be taught? They need to be taught why. Not just because I said so, but why. Teach them why it's, it's bad to have sex before marriage. Teach them why it's wrong to cheat on a test. Teach them why it is good not to gossip. Teach them why it is good to follow the Lord and respect authority and if you follow me, teach them the why because the why is what will motivate, and make the, motivate them to continue. Parents need to instruct their children from, from the Bible. Please do not instruct them from the news <clears throat> or from the Hollywood. God forbid. But here's the truth. Or from them stupid little devices we carry around in our pocket because the truth is this if you don't teach them those things will and they'll build their life on them everybody on the planet is trying to speak into your child's life be sure the loudest voice they hear is yours and not because it's (laughs) mean but because it's consistent and a constant part of them And whatever you do, folks, please, listen, we're, we're, we, care, we care about our kids. We're doing everything we can to, to, to help you and to teach children. But do not farm the spiritual teaching of your children out to your pastor or your church. Don't farm that out. Deuteronomy says it's the parent's responsibility to teach their children. We're here to help you. We're here to come alongside you. But we can't do it with an hour a week or even two. You have them all the time. Don't farm that out. Instruct them from the Bible. <clears throat> and parents need to correct their children. You can flip the page backwards if you want to Proverbs chapter 22 for this verse. <clears throat> it's 22 verse 6. Seeing the standard version says, Start children off the way they should go, and even when they're old, they'll not turn from it. Or in the... Uh, That's the NIV, I'm sorry. The English Standard Version says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will not depart from it. 
Um, this, this verse, my friends, is one of the most misunderstood and misused verses in all of Proverbs, if not all of Scripture. And I hear it often. But <clears throat> what's happened is it, 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 it's become very confusing and very troubling to many parents and grandparents. And why is that? Well, because it seems to promise that if you start your children on the, on the right way, or if you train them biblically right, then when they're older, they will keep living the right way, or if they go away, they'll come back to it. That's what it seems to teach. So, does this mean that if I raise them right, they will always turn out right? Well, what about those who don't? can't tell you how many parents or grandparents have who've come to me struggling with this verse because their child is not how they train them to be what if they don't well then logic would indicate if you follow this particular ideology or theology logic would indicate it's the parents fault and that's what happens that's why it's so misunderstood so troubling so heartbreaking for so many because they come and say, I just didn't do, I didn't do the right job. I would have done this. I should have done this. Didn't do that. It's my fault. That's what logic would seem to be saying here. <clears throat> but what about, listen, but what about the faithful parent who did raise them right, but when they became adults, they said, well, now I'm an atheist. What about that one? Or what about, let me, let's just broaden it. What about the parent who raised three children according to the, to, to the ways of the Lord and two of them remained faithful but one of them didn't and they got the same instruction? Y'all follow me? Everybody plugged in? So what then does it mean? And, and, and where does personal responsibility come in? Because when Jesus was asked about this subject, he argued that the sins of the parents do not mean that their kids will be blessed or cursed, for each one is responsible for their own sins. Okay, so to handle that, some will argue that Proverbs is a book of principles, not promises. In other words, this is books just full of only principles, which means that some of the times it happens, some of the times it don't. Well, I don't want to follow that because... That's pretty tricky. In fact, that's risky philosophy. Why is that? Because then, if I'm going to do that with the book of Proverbs, then what that would mean, if it's just principles and promises, which means sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, what that would mean is that if I don't lean on all my understanding and in all my ways acknowledge the Lord, then sometimes He will direct my path. But that's not what it says. So, let me try to help. (laughs) clear up some things, I hope, and help you understand this verse better. Clear up some misunderstanding. Folks, the best way to understand this verse is to take it as it's written. So let's do that. But here's the thing. We usually take this verse in the positive command. Stay with me. We take it in the positive command, meaning if you do right, then your kids will turn out right. Now, we, why do we do that? Why do we take it every time in the positive command? Because almost every, almost every single English translation adds a word or a phrase to this verse that's not in the Hebrew. Now, English translations do that to help with translation, but because they've done it, they've actually made an interpretation. So the word that is not in the original Hebrew is the word right or should. So I read it this way, and by the, word, by, the, by the way, the word train, which is why the NIV says start, that's what it means, start out, so it's in the beginning, it's when they're little, so it says start out, that's a better, really it's a better word or translation than train. So let's read it that way, <clears throat> train up the child in the way he go, even when he's old he will not depart from it. Leave the word should or write out because it's not in the original language. English added the word. But if you add it, it changes everything. <clears throat> the literal translation is this. You might want to write this down if it's not in your notes. Start a child out in accordance with his way, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Start a child out in accordance to his way, he will not depart from it. Start a child out in accordance to his 
way or hers, and he won't leave it. Now, the Hebrew word, his way, darkau, means his natural inclination, his natural tendency. So let's ask this. So here's what I say. If you start a child out in his natural inclination, in his natural tendency, he'll stay with it, and it'll grow. Now, what is the natural inclination of a child? What is the natural inclination of a child? What is his natural tendency? Proverbs 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it from him. Several verses in Proverbs says foolishness characterizes youth. Now, why is that true? Because, folks, listen, our nature's broken. Our nature's broken. We are born with a sin nature that needs redeemed, that needs reborn, fixed by Jesus through His, through his cross and His resurrection. Folks, let me do you ever have to teach your kids to sin? Did you ever have to teach your son to pull your daughter's hair because she didn't give him the toy? Or did he see you pull your wife's hair because you, she didn't give you the remote? I hope not. <laughs> now, you didn't have to do that. Now, here's what the culture says. The culture is screaming this at us. The culture is saying, let children have their way. That's what it's screaming at us. Let children have what they want. Everything from material things to their identity. Let them have what they want. Folks, listen. You know what God says? That is foolish and dangerous. For Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end its way leads to death. The best interpretation of Proverbs 22, verse 6 is sort of sarcastic. Danny Aiken, president of Southeastern Seminary, says this. It's really a sar- it's almost sarcastic. Here's what it's saying. Let a child have his way when he's young, and when he's old, he'll continue to insist on having it. Folks, this verse is not a positive command. It's a negative one. It is not saying if I teach them right, they'll turn out right. What it's saying is if you let them continue down their sinful path, it'll get worse. So make a note out by that verse, circle the word should or right, and say, this is, read it without it. And it changes the text. What it means is, if you let them have their way, just wait till they grow up. You follow that? Now, it's not promising. This verse does not promise. So let me encourage some of you. This verse does not promise that if you teach them right, they will turn out right. This verse promises that if you just let them have anything they ever want, they'll get worse. unless the Lord intervenes in their life. And that's what salvation is. If you let them be selfish when they're young, then they'll continue. The Atlantic included an article by a teacher who criticized parents for their inability to just say no. Here's what the teacher said. The teacher says, I see the way their parents treat them, and it's a big adjustment when they get into my class. It's good for them to realize that they aren't the center of the world. That sometimes other people's feelings matter more than theirs at a particular moment. If not, they become impulsive because they're not thinking about anybody else. Every year, parents come to me and say, My child won't listen to me. Why won't she just take no for an answer? And you know what I say? I say, Your child won't take no for an answer because the answer's never no. If you say that they cannot stop by Sonic on their way home, and then you let them call you and argue you into it, and then say, but no, it'll be no next time, then what you've taught them is no is never no. If they'll grow up, won't be able to share in marriage. They won't be able to submit to a boss. They'll think they can do whatever they want because there's no accountability. No is never no. This verse is calling us to correct our children. Proverbs 29, 15, 17 says, To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. Discipline your children, and they will give you peace of mind and make your heart glad. Proverbs 19, 18, Discipline your children while there's hope 
Otherwise, you'll ruin their lives. <laughs> Proverbs 13, 24, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. Those who love children care enough to, to discipline. So how, how do I correct them? Well, first of all, you begin with everything we've talked about so far. That's how we correct them, through the teaching of Scripture, through the model of Scripture, teach them what, it's, what it means to repent, what it means to live after the Lord. So I start there. <laughs> but then sometimes discipline is necessary. That's positive discipline, by the way. Sometimes negative discipline is necessary. What's that mean? Well, I'm just going to, Pastor Sam said, I'm not going to shy away from the truth in Scripture, and neither am I. Proverbs calls for spanking, even if the modern culture says it's wrong. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they'll not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Listen, folks. Pain teaches the body discipline. Does anybody work out? You know that's true. No pain, no gain. My family and I raise horses. We've got about 20 or so on the farm. And we've got several foals. And they're two or three months old now. And this little colt, I, I, he's just so cute. He, he loves human attention. He loves to come to me. But, but there was a time uh, a, a, about a month ago where he'd come up behind me and he'd kind of nudge on me, nudge on me, and then he'd knit me. And he had teeth already. And I'm thinking, poor mom. <laughs> He's still nursing a while. <laughs> He'd nip me. Well, you know what I did? I'd turn around, put two fingers together, and tag him in the neck. Two or three times, and he quit. It's called a horse bite. <clears throat> he didn't like that pain, and he stopped. Pain, listen, spanking's not dangerous if it's done correctly. What's that mean? Well, let me just run through this list. Never, never do it in anger. It's not correct if it's done in anger even if it means you've got to cool off for a while. Never do it in anger. Never do it for accidents. Never spank harmfully. That's an abuse of strength. Be careful. Never spank in public. And never remove acceptance or love from any form of punishment. It's to be age-appropriate and done only for defiance and dishonesty. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent His rebuke because the Lord's discipline disciplines those He loves and a father the son He delights in. Proverbs calls for reproof. Verse 29, verse 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. And what that means is as the child grows older, the adjustment of punishment is necessary. Spanking is no longer appropriate. Instead, reproof, which is restriction, should be enough. It changes as the child ages. Well, I want to close with an inter interesting article. The Houston Police Department wrote this. Houston Police Department, it wasn't written by Christians, is written, not well, there could be some Christians on staff maybe, but it's but written by the Houston Police Department, and they wrote 12 rules for raising delinquent children. You follow me? Here's how. Here's how you raise delinquent children. Here's the 12 rules. You ready? Number one, begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants. In this way, he will grow to believe the world owes him a living. Number two, when he picks up bad words, laugh at him. This will make him think he's cute. And it will also encourage him to pick up cuter phrases that will blow the top off of your head later. Number three, never give him any spiritual training. Wait till he's 21, then let him decide for himself. I don't know what number I'm on, so I'm just going to keep reading. Avoid the use of the word wrong. It could develop a guilt complex. And this will condition him to later to believe later, when he's arrested for stealing a car, that society is against him and he's been being persecuted. Pick up everything he leaves lying around, books, shoes, and clothes. Do everything for him so that he will, ex he will be experienced in throwing all responsibility to others. Let him read any printed matter that he can get his hands on. Be careful that the silverware and drinking glasses are sterilized, but don't worry about what his mind is feasting on regarding garbage. 
Quarrel frequently in the presence of your children. In this way, they will not be too shocked when the home is broken up later. Give the child all the spending money he wants. Never let him earn his. Why should he have to have things as tough as you did? Satisfy his every craving for food, drink, and comfort. See that every sensual desire is gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustration. Take his part against neighbors, teachers, and policemen. They are all prejudiced, prejudiced against your child anyway. When he gets into real trouble, apologize to yourself by saying, I never could do anything with him. Finally, prepare yourself for a life of grief because you'll surely have it. How to, relate, how to raise delinquent children. <clears throat> Folks, ultimately, my friends, ultimately our, our verse is reminding us that our parenting responsibility is missional. These passages are reminding us that our responsibility is missional. What do I mean? I mean, <clears throat> what our kids and our grandkids need more than anything else is not behavior modification, it's life transformation. And that's what Proverbs, again, is about. If you don't read it with an understanding of the gospel, you'll see it as only behavior modification, and that's not what it is. It's about life change. And life can only be changed. Listen, the only way we can transform our lives, the only way our broken nature can be changed is through a, through a saving relationship with Jesus. He is wisdom. It's only through Christ I can do any of that. Folks, teaching and training and correction, all the stuff we talked about today, it isn't, it, it's not given to us just to be shared as information or, or even as punishment. Every one of the things we, we've talked about today, as is every opportunity in life with our kids and our grandkids, is an opportunity to explain and live out the gospel. To show them what's right and what's wrong and why. To show them what Jesus did for us is where the only way we can find forgiveness. Showing that it's only Him who can change us and help us and correct us. And to show them, yeah, sometimes I'm going to stumble and I'll make that mistake. And I might make it again, but I know where to turn. I know what to keep striving for. And I do it all because of the gospel. It's always about the gospel. So folks, listen, the culture's not going to teach them right and wrong regarding the gospel. And it's not the school's responsibility to do it. And some definitely aren't going to do it. And listen, it's not even the church's responsibility to do it. We have a responsibility to help you. It's ours. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, families. It's our responsibility to show them the gospel. To teach them the gospel. Would you bow your head with me this morning? You remember what we said in the beginning? Don't look at this list as if you're a parent or grandparent, whether your kids are little or grown, as a list of things to get beat up over. It's not what it's intended to do. If clearly, if there are some sin and mistakes that you need to ask God's forgiveness for, then do so, and you can. And you should ask Him. He'll forgive you. <laughs> See them as things to grow in. God, how can, I, how can I grow in this? And I would strongly, strongly remind you, don't tune out. Say, you know what? My job is done. It's finished. I did this or I didn't do that right or whatever. Oh, no, no, no. It's amazing how so many of these things, God gives us opportunities to show children and grandchildren. Sometimes it's at church. Sometimes it's with your neighbor kids. And you might not have all the responsibilities that the parent has, but you can live out the gospel in front of them. There's some forms of correction you can't do, but there are some things you can. Father, I thank you so much for your word today. <clears throat> and Lord, I'm reminded of what Sam shared with us in our offering time. There's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, doesn't have a relationship with you, that God, it all begins there, and I pray if there's someone who needs to do that, that, that they would today. Today is the day they would ask for your forgiveness of sins and to submit their life to you. In a few moments, Lord, we're, we'll dismiss and have opportunities for them to speak to our pastors and other leaders about how to do that. And I pray, God, you'd give them the courage to do so. God, as a parent, I'm not a grandparent yet, but as I am a parent, 
It is a job that never quits. That's true. My dad always reminds me of that. Dad is still, he doesn't have some of the responsibilities or authority that he used to have. But he's not stopped being a parent. He's not stopped giving me instruction from the Word or showing me what it means to live right. And he's not stopped showing me what to do when he makes mistakes. I pray that I would not forget that. For indeed, I pray that I would do the same. That all of us would continue. And remember, Lord, that there are children, there are grandchildren all around us. And biologically, Lord, they might not be ours, but that doesn't mean we don't have some responsibilities. God, the world is broken and fallen apart. The only hope for a happy home is Jesus. Help us, Lord. We don't want to lose a generation. And God, even if it's a remnant, I pray that we will do everything that we possibly can to see that the remnant comes to know you. I'm so grateful that salvation is offered to everyone who will accept it. Help us to instruct. Help us to model. Help us to be the parents you want us to be. Forgive us when we haven't been. In Jesus' name, amen.